class. So in this part of the lecture, we're gonna talk about a few other conditions, um, starting with pulmonary embolisms. So pulmonary embolisms are the third most common cause of death in hospitalized patients. Um, now, pulmonary embolisms typically occur in someone who has you know, a, a venous thrombus, a, a DVT of some kind, or are at a risk for thrombus, okay? Um, typically, you know, in, in the practice settings we're gonna be working in, someone has a thrombus in the leg and it embolizes and it travels to the lungs. Remember, a DVT, you know, could travel and go to the brain, giving you a stroke. You could travel to the heart, giving you a heart attack, and could now also travel to the lungs, causing you to have a pulmonary embolism. Now, it can lead to core pulmonale, which we talked about as that right heart failure because we elevate pulmonary artery pressures. Um, it can make the right heart work really hard. And again, our right heart is afterload sensitive. Anything that raises a pressure in the right side, the right circuit, um, you know, is not a good situation because our, our right ventricle does not, absolutely does not have um, the ability to accommodate for any increases in pressure. Uh, it's also going to affect the pulmonary circulation um, and overall just making it harder for um, the, the lungs to do their job, right? To vent, to exchange gases, um, you know, and, and oxygenate our bodies. And again, it starts typically somewhere else, um, you know, and, and travels elsewhere. Now, the, the most common symptoms of pulmonary embolism are dyspnea. Um, again, dyspnea is common in a lot of conditions, but Dyspnea, sharp chest pain, kind of sudden chest pain. Um, they'll have some pain with breathing. Tachypnea and tachycardia. Tachycardia will be because if we lose, you know, again, like perfusion, we lose pulmonary artery, we're not able to pump blood effectively out of the right side. Um, you, know, you know, we aren't able to effectively pump out of the left side, uh, potentially leading to, um, you know, having the left heart have, you know, have to be a little bit faster to make up for the loss of um, blood flow. Um, they also have this kind of muddled appearance on just on examination, especially when it gets worsened. Um, so, let me advance this here. Uh, the, the identify whether or not someone has uh, a uh, pulmonary embolism just like at the DVT, there is a well score for the for pulmonary embolisms. Um, you go by each of these, uh, you know, their signs or history. Again, PEs are pretty are you know more common in patients who have a DVT who already have a thrombus that, that lyses and goes somewhere, um, like the lungs. Um, if an alternative di diagnosis is less likely, so it's like not a pneumonia or something else that could be causing a you know their chest pain or dyspnea. Um, and then the other big sign is hematitis, so coughing up blood. That's another kind of big sign there. So again, you know, if someone you know, that you're seeing post-operatively, maybe post-orthopedic surgery, we talk about the high risk potentially for, um, you know, blood clots. If you see a patient in your clinic after, you know, hip replacement or knee replacement, and they've got, um, you know, a, you know, shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, maybe pulse oximetry is dropping a little bit too. That's not part of the criteria, but also often happens. You know, DVT or uh, a PE due to a DVT that lysed um, and embolized is, should be on the top of your radar. Now to score it, um, anything above a six is a high suspicion. Um, anything between two to six, a moderate suspicion. Anything below two um, is a low suspicion. Um, I for also forgot to mention that uh, malignancy is included on here. People may ask kind of why that's the case. Um, again, uh, cancer, you know, there's a high risk for, for blood clots in anyone with cancer. Um, so that, that's, a, that's why it's included on their malignancy. Um, if a patient, you know, falls at least above a four um, on that score, they'll often get a D-dimer test. D-dimer um, is a byproduct of fibrin kind of breakdown. So if someone develops a clot, D-dimer um, will be elevated because the body will start to kind of actively break down its own blood clots. It's kind of, the, you know, the, the negative feedback loop that ensues after any blood clot. So if we see it elevated, it indicates, yeah, it may be a pretty big clot or a clot is formed somewhere in the body. Um, if the D-dimer test is positive and their score is above four, um, we're going to probably consider uh, diagnostic imaging, probably get a CT scan uh, to look at, you know, where the size potentially of the, of the blood clot. If they're above um, 
above a four, a negative D of a dimer, we could consider, um, you know, the PE is unlikely, or sorry, less than four, we can consider uh, the D dimer to be like, uh, likely. So uh, equal or less than four D dimer. Um, so it's, again, that's that person who's above two, you know, um, two to four-ish. So they're in that moderate range. Um, and the D dimer is negative as well. So while they're still moderate, we've done our D dimer, it's negative, PE is probably unlikely. And then we're gonna look at maybe other, other potential causes of their, of their symptoms. So again, we score it, you know, six or above, very high suspicion, um, less than two, they're probably not gonna get a D dimer. If they're falling in that moderate range or really anything above, a, you know, around a four-ish, um, or really anything above, sorry, above a two in that moderate range will probably get their D dimer. And then based on the results of the D dimer, and their score, um, it'll influence whether or not someone um, you know, has, a, has a PE. So again, there, you know, it's a, it helps us elucidate when there are those cases that are a little bit um, more moderate. So if someone's like six or above, uh, they're gonna get D-dimer, but we're probably gonna, probably gonna end up getting follow-up imaging um, just because of the very high likelihood um, of, of that uh, being a PE. Uh, pulmonary edema, a um, little bit different. I wanna make sure that I stress this, pulmonary edema is not the same thing as a pleural effusion, right? Not the same thing. Pulmonary edema is accumulation of fluid in the extravascular compartments of the lungs, not the pleura. So essentially what happens is there's a failure of the capillary or the alveolar epithelium to protect the respiratory system from this buildup of fluid, or there is impaired lymphatics in the pulmonary vasculature. So there's more fluid in the lung interstitium Right, the lungs, if you can think of this, are swollen, okay? And the plasma fluid moves from the pulmonary capillaries into the lung interstitium and eventually into the alveoli. So either there's, you know, um, you know there's something that um, is causing the lymphatics to fail, like they're holding on to more fluid, they're not draining, the lungs aren't draining, the lung tissue, not the alveoli, the interstitium. Um, the cap pulmonary capillaries are potentially too, you know, engorged for some reason. And then we end up seeing um, you know, that fluid moves from the pulmonary capillaries into the lung interstitium, the pressure in the interstitium gets too high, it will eventually spill over into the alveoli and we get some serious problems there, right? Because we're disrupting now the alveolar capillary interface. Causes of this can be uh, left ventricular uh, heart failure. This will be a backflow of fluid that should be leaving the left ventricle, isn't leaving effectively and is backflowing up through the pulmonary veins, back into the pulmonary vasculature, raising pulmonary filtration pressure, and potentially leaching fluid into the interstitium, which can eventually get into the alveoli, or potentially leaching directly into the alveoli if filtration pressures are too high, and the alveolar epithelium fails. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we can see this in if acute lung injury, and we'll go over that. This is what um, patients with uh, that COVID uh, virus, um, like there, some of the some of the pathogenesis of this was similar to this. We'll talk about um, a very specific type of acute lung injury causing you know swelling and stuff in in, in the lungs, and then uh, pulmonary embolisms can cause these and drowning. This is what also happens. We get fluid buildup in the interstitium of the lungs, leading to failure, um, or there's fluid in in there's fluid in the alveoli. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, so. The symptoms are extreme dyspnea, restlessness, anxiety, um, and a sense of suffocation. Like they're just, they can't breathe. Like they're being basically suffocated from the inside out. Uh, the signs, they may have this uh, pink frothy sputum, and that's from the, the plasma, the blood fluid, um, mixing kind of in the alveoli, creating this like frothy um, spit, basically, sputum, uh, that, they, that they, if they excise, you'll see it. It's got all these bubbles in it because there's, there's blood mixing with the air, and that's not supposed to happen in, in that manner. Uh, blood in the alveoli or fluid in the alveoli. They'll be pale because we're not oxidating well. We're shutting off basically, um, you know, those alveoli from gas exchange. Um, they'll be sweating. They'll be just, you know, you know, crackles over those areas, decreased breath sounds over those areas. Again, it's abnormal accumulation of fluid in the extravascular components. The fluid that should be in the capillaries are now in the alveoli, in the lung interstitium. This is a big problem. This is, this is potentially fatal. Um, you know, what this can kind of lead to in a patient with a pulmonary issue, especially acute lung injury, like you know, said coronavirus, or that very aggressive 
uh, pathogenesis can lead to a condition called acute respiratory distress sy syndrome or ARDS, um, which is the acute onset of non-cardiogenic edema. So this is not due to heart failure, or something of that nature. Um, so this is, uh, you know, could be, you know, pneumonia, could be sepsis, which is sepsis, again, is just diffuse inflammation due to some sort of infection causing multi-organ disease. That's what sepsis is, diffuse whole body inflammation from an infection, that's sepsis. Could be an aspiration of gastric contents, um, could be just, or just very severe trauma could, could cause it as well. Um, so we, again, we, in this situation, some people say that ARDS, especially due to an acute lung injury, is like the, the most severe form of pulmonary edema. It's like just like a pathogenesis progression or pathogenic, pathogenic progression. Uh, that can happen with pneumonias and sepsis especially. Again, um, it, uh, if it gets worse, it can lead to respiratory failure. We'll talk about what that means, and that's a very bad situation. Um, it's, and it's one of the more common causes of, of, of respiratory failure in critical care patients or critically ill patients. Um, it's you know, common overall, about 10% of ICU patients uh, globally. I don't know why I have ICU um, twice. <laughs> And the mortality rate is pretty high. It's about 30 to 40 percent. Like, and it's regional, depending on the availability for you to have a mechanical uh, ventilator, which is you know what we end up using to treat these patients, um, and maybe even an ECMO if it's if it's too severe. Um, and again, what ends up happening is we have this diffuse inflammation, um, which creates a lot of edema, a lot of swelling. But remember, with uh, uh, inflammation, you know, it allows for the um, you know, the, the, the blood vessels, their epithelial walls are open, they're, they're more likely to dump fluid, um, and then there's damage to the lung and the alveoli. What ends up happening is we have greater lung stiffness and decreased compliance because the lung is basically swollen and filled with fluid. Um, so it creates this restrictive defect acutely and really raises the work of breathing because just the lung is inflamed. Um, it is, you know, swollen and, and um, edematous due to this um, edema and diffuse inflammation. And what we end up seeing, again, this we can even, if you wanted to kind of, um, you know, slice this slide over to the pulmonary edema, it's similar kind of what happens here, but ARDS, again, could be due to different things, okay? So, again, the surface of the, of the alveolar epithelium, which we're talking about right here, Okay, this is the alveolar epithelium. Um, it's usually lined by these flat, you know, squamous um, type one alveolar cells, right? These guys, okay? Um, and then they have these cuboid shaped type two alveolar cells every, you know, every once in a while, these guys here, which produce again our surfactant. Um, and the, the combination of these, um, you know, epithelium, epithelial cells in the alveoli create a tight barrier that restricts the, the passage of any solutes, um, but only supposed to allow O2 and CO2 through, right? O2 and CO2 for gas exchange. Um, you know, the, eight, you know, the type two alveolar cells, are, of course, are circular surfactant, reducing surface tension, allowing the alveolar to stay open um, and fa help facilitate gas exchange. Um, both the type one and alve alveolar cells and type two alveolar cells have the ability to absorb some excess fluid if there's a, if there's a little bit excess. Um, that's facilitated by these sodium potassium pumps, as remember those, um, and they you know transport that fluid through ion transport. Again, we, we change the, the constitutions, we can move fluid around. Okay, um, when there's alveolar edema, the, the resorption of the of the fluid, um, you know, we we are you know we're we're leveraging these um, these pumps. If it becomes too uh, severe, then we start having problems. So again, normally we have our alveolar epithelium, we have our potassium, so in potassium pumps, we can handle a little bit of fluid, pump fluid out of the alveolum, get them into the lymphatics, um, you, know, in, you know, into the lung, you know, interstitium, in the, in the lung microcirculation, the clear lungs. We have, you know, a little bit of fluid. In ARDS, there's going to be increased permeability to liquid and protein. Again, thinking, thinking, go back to the basics of inflammation and how we have the you know, separation of, of epithelium, right, which you know, causes swelling um, into the you know, tissue. So essentially, we have increased permeability in the alveolar epithelium. We have increased permeability in the um, 
in the uh, the, uh, the pulmonary capillary. So we have just uh, you know a bunch of fluid leaving the capillary, right, and moving into the alveolar space, disrupting gas exchange. Right, this is all fluid here, um, so it's caused by a disruption in these epithelium, causing fluid to you know bypass um, you know this what normally is a barrier. Um, and causing um, disruption of that alveolar capillary interface. And again, normally this barrier is supposed to only be a cell thick. So anything that's like, you know, puts more in there. Remember that fixed loss principle. Um, it's going to impair gas exchange. So that's why we see diffuse hypoxemia in these patients, potentially even hypercapnia if it gets too severe. Again, this is what killed people who had COVID. Um, again, it, you know, we see this in other conditions, um, but that's like, that's what ended up causing people uh, to die. Now, there are some classifications for um, for ARDS. We have them here, either the Berlin definition or um, the Kigali modification to that definition. That's not something we're going to be too involved as PTs, but that's just kind of what this entails. So if this gets too severe, it can lead to, again, acute respiratory failure. So again, it, acute respiratory failure is inadequate gas exchange, either um, you know, it's either an imbalance between supply or imbalance in demand. And we'll show you kind of what that means. So there can be different causes of respiratory failure, not just, you know, impaired uh, or disruption of that alveolar capillary interface like we see in ARDS. There can be other causes of it too. Uh, but, you know, there's two subtypes to respiratory failure. Um, type 1 would be hypoxia. So we see low PO2. Again, normal PO2 is about 70 to about 100-ish. Um, and we've got a, you know, that wiggle room of about 60 before we start really having serious problems with that um, oxygen hemoglobin association. Again, remember PaO2 and then hemoglobin saturation, you know, here, EBO2 percentage. We start going below 60, especially, we see rapid reductions in the ability for hemoglobin to stay bound to, um, or oxygen to stay bound to hemoglobin, and we don't have an ability to transport oxygen to tissue anymore. That's a big problem. In type one, uh, while there is a low PO2, there's typically a normal PCO2, so blood gas of carbon uh, dioxide stays the same. In type two, um, respiratory failure, where's hypoxia and hypercapnia. So not only do we have inadequate gas delivery, we are impaired in, in our ability to remove waste or CO2. Um, and we also typically see uh, acidosis in the body. And again, uh, that's kind of, kind of bad as well because if we have acidosis, it's going to disrupt. Um, you know, not only do we have issues with gas transport, we now we've changed the, the cellular environment. So a lot of our metabolic processes are affected by that as well. So causes, again, could be a PE, pneumonia, overdose or is a big cause of this potentially as well. Um, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we have a nice kind of image to demonstrate this. Uh, the treatment um, of this, um, you know, your patient's going to be on respiratory support. They're going to be on either an invasive ventilation, some mechanical ventilation. They'll be intubated, um, or they'll be maybe receiving a positive airway ventilation, that non-invasive or that CPAP and BiPAP. Um, again, if it's really severe, they may be put on an ECMO where the a machine is doing the complete oxygenation of their blood as well. So um, we'll talk more about that in our acute care lecture. Um, here's a graph again showing you that it's not always just um, impaired um, you know, in, you know, impaired, um, uh, you know, diffusion. So it's not always necessarily just changes in, uh, you know, alveolar, um, you know, that, that swelling alveolar edema like we see in ARDS, um, you know, right? Uh, there can also be some mechanical changes, right? So we can see this potentially in patients with, um, you know, spinal cord lesion, as you can see in patients with, you know, obese or, or um, um, you know, obesity, like we talked about in patients uh, with the uh, Pickwickian syndrome, right? Um, so it's it's a, all about a balance between load, right? So the other resistive load, a long elastic load, chest wall elastic load, minute ventilation, or strength, or ability to compensate um, that load. Um, so again, um, this can, there can be a lot of different causes for the respiratory system to fail. Um, ARDS is a big one, big, 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 big concern. Now, um, when patients are ventilated, um, you know, there can be some acute changes as well. So thing, the, the story doesn't just end 
when someone's put on a vent. It's not, not, you know, they may recover, but being on a ventilator can also cause some very acute and very, very significant changes to our ability to breathe and respire, ventilate, and exchange gases. Um, the, the, the biggest one being ventilatory induced diaphragm dysfunction or VIDD. Um, this occurs when anyone's on prolonged vent mechanical ventilation. We see this rapid disuse, uh, rapid atrophy and weakness in the muscle. And, and, and by, you know, uh, prolonged, I mean, th this can actually occur pretty, pretty quickly. So we see these changes within 12 to 18 hours, um, mechanical, mechanical ventilation, um, initiation. Um, we see actually both, you know, in slow and fast switch fibers. And just by comparison, uh, this, this, these changes in atrophy and weakness um, exceed what you would even see with a phrenic nerve denervation. Like it's pretty rapid. Um, it happens even before we see someone um, see changes in their skeletal muscles. Um, so, you know, if someone is on bed rest for about three ish days, more than three days, three or four days, we start seeing atrophy in uh, the skeletal muscles because they're not being loaded anymore. You know, they're, they're on bed rest. Um, you know, so we can see this in, in, in you know, much less time, it's rapid, rapid, rapid atrophy. We think uh, the atrophy in the breathing muscles can be due to just they're unloaded. Remember, your, your breathing muscles are something that work constantly, right? They're used to being loaded, we, and we suddenly are no longer using them. The mechanical ventilator is doing the work. It, they can re they weaken really quickly. We also think it's maybe due to oxidative stress, which can happen by being on a vent. It can also happen just from critical illness. Um, or reduction in antioxidant capacity, which can happen with, with critical illness in the muscle. Um, we also think people have baseline thinner diaphragms, um, which we can assess on ultrasound, um, are at a higher risk as well. Now, um, the reason why we bring this up is in patients um, who get VIDD, they end up, they, a lot of them fail to wean. Um, we, we think it contributes about 20 to 30% of cases that fail to wean from vents. And again, the longer you're on a vent, the higher risk you have for infections and other serious complications, you know, because if you're on a vent, you're not moving too much, right? You're also potentially having a vector, right, of, you know, of infection, you know, your staff that grows everywhere. If you're in a hospital, there's very nasty uh, bacteria that are very aggressive. So we want to get people, you know, on ventilators if they need it, but we want them off as soon as possible. Um, and if they, you know, develop this VIDD, it can prolong their time on a ventilator and they have big, big problems. Um, and again, we think this is pretty common. Like it's, it, it may be present up to 54% of patients on vents within the first day of being on the vent. So again, um, and sometimes patients can be on vents for weeks. Just think again, um, you know, if you unload those muscles, right, it's basically, you know, if you had a cast, if you think of it, an analogy, put a cast on your muscle, on your arm, you know, your arm muscles are gonna atrophy. You're basically putting a splint in a certain sense, if you wanna think of it that way, and unloading the diaphragm. Um, and it rapidly, rapidly weakens. So um, what we can see, again, is just protein uh, degradation. We see changes in the calcium sensitivity. So not only see mass reductions and atrophy, we also see, um, you know, this force producing properties change. So not only is mass, but strength, you know, are, are, are changing, so we atrophy and weakness uh, present. We think there's multiple causes. We could, it could be the you know, inflammation, it could be um, just the unloading, um, but either way, it leads to this impaired impairments, rapid impairments in strength um, and muscle mass in patients with atrophy, uh, with uh, VIDD or on vents. So again, just a, kind of an example of what we see here. We see these very, very, um, you know, much smaller muscles in these patients, um, even again, following, you know, 18 hours, uh, potentially of mechanical ventilation. The good thing is, um, now that we're more aware of this stuff, the Levine paper here was a, 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 a seminal paper that is identifying this, a lot of work from the group down at the University of Florida, Danny Martin, Barbara Smith, um, we're big in, you know, in identifying this and developing weaning protocols where patients, um, are gradually brought down, put on lower pressure, um, and, and practicing what we call spontaneous breathing trials where those muscles start to work again on their own, um, as well as initiating respiratory muscle training um, to help keep those muscles um, as strong as they can. The good thing is, um, once patients are weaned, if they're adequately trained, those muscles typically recover 
pretty quickly too. You can think of the, the respiratory muscles almost like quicksilver. They atrophy really quickly and potentially they recover if they're trained and loaded appropriately. So they, they can kind of get back to normal if we, if we train them appropriately. The problem is not everyone does this. So hopefully uh, you guys will take this information and, and run with it. So um, that is uh, all I have for our acute conditions. Again, remembering that you know these are acute conditions, but they can absolutely happen in patients with uh, chronic conditions uh, as well. So uh, thank you.